Hey, so uh, I'm Phil Newman, uh, Director of Product Focus on Social, Nike Social Network, and we're trying to brand it now. Um, John, this is the Consumer Profile Team. Sure, I'm Sean Jai, I work with Jackson on the Consumer Profile Team, Product Manager. And so our two teams work very, very closely together on a lot of things. Uh, I think we would call our, our product visions and strategies very tightly coupled. And in one of those kind of odd fluke moments in Nike, we were, I was at a meeting and made just a, an offhanded kind of light comment that evolved into uh, the research paper and a whole lot of other things at this point. And kind of wanted to tell you guys that story right now. Um, so I think, Nishan, this was like your second or third week? Third week, yes. Yeah, third week. week. And we were in a meeting together, and I made some comment about the growth in the Google Plus and the Facebook user platforms, and how many people were actively engaged on those platforms, how many people were there, and how they were approximately at the same number of users in their user base, but their active users were different, but they took such divergent paths to get to that same number, that same metric. So we wanted to talk about that and do a little bit of research on that. Um, so what we first did was we started with are these truly apples to apples? And so we wanted to just make sure that we were looking at the same thing. So we did a quick feature comparison of Google Plus and Facebook. And this was just a quick mapping. Of, you can see some of the brand things that you see from Facebook. You see Open Graph. Well, yeah, Google Plus calls that activities. But this is the way. So after looking at this for a moment, we said, yeah, these are close enough. We'll make sure that we're looking at the right thing. So then we started looking at what does it mean? What happened to the user growth? And specifically, we started with Facebook. So, so before I talk about the graph, let's go back a little bit and talk about the meeting that Phil had. This was a special meeting. It was my third week. We were in a meeting. After Jackson was in that meeting, I couldn't understand more than ninety percent of what was being said in the meeting. I was like Joey on Friends. I was nodding my head, <laughs> trying to pretend like I knew what I was talking about. And then Phil mentioned that, "Hey, I'm going to do this research project where we see how these two platforms grew." And at the end of the meeting, I'm like, "You know, I want to write this paper." I had just gotten told by LinkedIn, hey, you can publish on LinkedIn. I'm like, this could become a good post. And I went back and forth in my mind. Should I, should I not talk? And then I just did it. I just ran behind him across the building, almost hit Aaron Bellick. Chased my, me down yeah. as I was headed out the door. Yeah, <laughs> I almost ran into my boss's boss, and I told him, hey, let's write this paper. And it took us a month, and that's what this became to be. So back to the, to the topic at hand. So this graph talks about how the users grew in Facebook. So 2005 was when it all began. Uh, if you notice, a few things come out of this graph. In the beginning, we're talking about pretty consistent growth. This is when Facebook went from being a students-only Harvard enterprise to something that was open for everybody. They had a solid platform, a few basic things that they made available for pretty much everybody across the board. And then at some point, there was a, a pivot point. There was something, a huge amount of growth here from 2008 to 2009 and then on forward. And then at some point, the graphs, the, dif the distance between the users and those people that are act extremely active narrowed down. We have data that's coming up down the road that will show exactly what was going on behind the scenes. Who was using these features? What were these features? But the graph actually tells us something pretty important about Facebook. The growth has been pretty consistent, led by some pretty significant bursts 2008 on out. We did the same analysis for Google. Plus, now Google Plus didn't launch their platform until late 2011, and you can see it's been a very spiked growth as far as number of users, but not nearly as actively as engaged. So we began to question, does that matter for Google Plus? Is that something they want to go after, and why? And so uh, we walked through in all these features as well for Google to see how they compare. Let's talk about what Facebook did first. Sure. So remember the graph that I showed you a few minutes ago? Uh, we had pretty consistent growth up, up until 2008, and then there was a sudden spike and the gap narrowed between the people that were actually using the, the platform and people that were using it very, very actively. And we call Facebook a platform, and here's why. In 2005, at the end of 2006, they had five and a half million, so pretty good base of student users. Uh, and then they added, between this, they had photo storage. People wanted that. That took them to five and a half uh, million. Then they added the new speed and the general availability. This is when they opened it up for everybody. The growth doubled. Again, we're talking about a pretty small size base from five and a half to 12 million, but still doubled in one year. We're at 12 million here. And then as we go from 2007 to 2008, we have self-service ads, we have pages, and we have the Facebook platform. This is where they made the entire audience complicit in their growth, which is not only are you participating in the Facebook platform, but you're actually using the platform to build something which means that Facebook has a ready-made way of knowing, hey, what do people want? 
what do people want to build? They did. Okay. No. As I say, they took this platform and they used it as a consumer feedback. Loop. Exactly. They heard from developers, what do we need next? What's our next feature to add? Yeah. Perfect. So that took them from 12 to 15 minutes. That's a 4-4 four, four growth. From 5 and a half to 12, that's twice. But then from 12 to 50, that's four times. This is important for us at Nike because we're always wondering, what's going to drive engagement? What's the best time to do something? We do a lot of research in this. And this serves as a pretty good experiment in terms of understanding how one of the most iconic social networks of our time grew. From 50 million now to 100 million, what changed? Chat. We may not want to talk to each other in person, but boy, on the internet, we're all for it. So, went from 50 to 100 million. And then from 2009 to 2010, from 100 million to 360 million, the like button. We may scream at each other on TV, we may honk at each other on the road, but boy, liking each other on Facebook, <laughs> we want a piece of that. So again, from 100 million to 360 million. So the thing with like, though, is it federated Facebook across the entire web. Every website suddenly had this like button and exactly. had a thumbs up and made it ubiquitous everywhere. Yeah. It's amazing that people like like so much that they want a dislike button as well. So, but but what, from 360 million now, we went to 608 million. That's Facebook places. So now we're going from who I am and who I'm talking to to where I am. It's again expanding the realm of the social universe. So that's 680 million, and then we added the timeline. This was a pretty <coughs> controversial move. People didn't like it. There were howls of protest. The growth wasn't quite as electric. Maybe it was because timeline never quite caught on. Maybe it was because there was some saturation because Google Plus, as Phil will tell you, had started making some moves right around here. So that may have explained why some of the growth wasn't that fast. Then from, eight, from here on out, we have Instagram because they realized that mobile was really taken over. By this time, the smartphone era had really taken hold. Everybody you knew had a smartphone almost. So that took us to 845 million, and to, to a billion, I'm sorry. And then you had graph search that took uh, you to 1.23 million, and then you, there was a WhatsApp purchase. Uh, this was Facebook's attempt to make a bit of a toehold in Asia, other parts of the world, but Facebook isn't quite as prevalent. And then the next step here is Facebook at work. We don't know what that's going to look like. But again, if you go from left to right, you will see very clearly that you start out with a platform at a steady pace, and then you throw in one feature after the other. But Phil's right. The Facebook platform is a pretty iconic moment, because if not for this, we don't know if this cavalry of features would have been possible. This made it possible for them to bring the whole world into their platform. And that brought them to 1.3 million plus users right now. Cool. So you can imagine Google, on the other hand, being the ubiquitous name, and it's, it's actually a verb, right? We Google things, and we use it in common language. Let me just Google that. Well, they can see this growth curve as well as anybody else and see that immediately as a threat. So what do they do is they counter with Google+, Plus, which, again, launched in 2011. But how do they quickly grow a user base? Rather than actually take and grow from nothing, they started with what existing properties do we already own? What do we have? Where do we have existing consumers? And let's begin to lump and consolidate and layer on a social network lightly on top of them. So what we have is general availability in late 2011, um, timeline refresh, which after their immediate launch, it looked as if the only people using Google Plus were really what we'll call second degree circles. It was Google and friends of people who work at Google, maybe family members of people who work at Google. But what happens, they did a timeline refresh. They really focused on the content, particularly photos and videos, getting those front and center, taking away all the extraneous noise, brought them up to 400 million. That's a pretty sizable move there. And then through 2013, five major things they did that moved this forward. They integrated, they, they took an existing product, Google Voice, rebranded it as, as Google Hangouts, integrated it in. So now I've got direct video conferencing, video discussions. They integrated it with cloud, so Google Drive. So now I can suddenly take my documents, my presentations that I'm already online collaborating with, I can integrate them into the social network and share them. Inline photo editing, um, related hashtags, find content that's similar to mine. And of course, the YouTube account merge, which we'll talk about a little bit more, where they took their existing platform of, of YouTube, which they bought way back here in 2004, or five, somewhere around there, and they said, we're gonna merge these accounts Overall, consumers fought back, but a great product win took them to over a billion users by the end of 2013. In the year 2014 so far, they've done some amazing things. If you haven't looked at the integration of what they've done with their Drive product and some of the Google Sheets and Google Docs and how they've integrated those into Hangouts, there it's amazing. You can run tremendous business right there. I've seen people run entire startup meetings and design sessions within a Google Hangout. 
Um, I'll tell you, I know a 12-year-old kid who runs a Boy Scout troop out of it where he's doing spreadsheets for budgets, for camping, for plans, tour permits, uh, uploads photos, has video conferences, the whole bit. Amazingly easy integration. Now, Google's a little bit more tight-lipped with their roadmap for what's coming next. So it'll be interesting to see, but approximately right now, they're at about 1.2, 1.3 billion users. Again, not as actively engaged as you saw in the first graph. They're not as engaged in Google+, Plus, but they're equally engaged in all the subsidiary products, whether, whether it's Gmail or Google Voice or YouTube or any one of the hundreds of products that Google has out there. So a couple things that we talk, thought about for next things to go through and think about in this research was really... You know, when you talk about Google Plus itself, is that an apples to apples comparison with Facebook because of all the subsidiary products? You know, do you need, if you really want to look at these things side by side and as equals, do you have to include Gmail? Do you have to include YouTube? Do you have to go pull those user and active numbers and consolidate those rather than look at them from the overarching Google Plus perspective? Also, you know, as I mentioned, um, the YouTube and Google Plus account consolidation was, was really bashed online. Users did not like that. Consumers generally called that a, the worst thing. It was a terrible failure from a consumer point of view. But from a product point of view, it was a huge win where it really boosted numbers, got a base consolidated. I'm sure it had a lot of technical benefits behind the scenes. You know, the, the question is, what could they have done differently? How could they have managed that a little better? Okay. So the other two questions uh, that I like are, what, what is the proposition behind all the data being collected? We're talking about huge amounts of data, where you check in, what you like. Just this morning I was reading the story, you may have heard about Uber, about the VP who wanted to go after a journalist, you know, we have their travel logs, we know what they do. Is that going to create a sense of spookiness in Big Brother culture, and what's, is that going to create a problem in terms of people not giving correct data? Is that going to blow up our whole analytics process because people want the features? but they do not want access to the data as far as the user is concerned. So that's going to be a big question. How does all this user and data get quantified, monetized, and used appropriately? And then is discovery harder in Google Plus and Facebook? So, and Phil and I have talked about this back and forth. Uh, Facebook is different in the sense that it's a platform. You do everything in Facebook. You like somebody on Facebook. Even if you like somebody elsewhere, it's still Facebook. You know, Google Plus is different. You might use Gmail. You might use Google Docs. You aren't really using Google Plus all the time. So. How is that being approached? How, how is that going to essentially work in terms of the product growth, especially since now Google has this really big base of 1.3 million? And what is that going to do in terms, in terms of discovery? Like contacting somebody via Facebook is so much easier than contacting somebody via Google. So that's going to be a very interesting challenge going forward. So we're talking about a part two of our paper, publishing it on LinkedIn, presenting it here again. It may be one of these four questions. It may be something that these platforms does. That's totally different. So we're excited, and we're happy to get your questions now. But so far, just just to let you know how the paper, how what we've written has been received so far, we've got a few thousand views on LinkedIn. Between the two of us, we've come up with what three thousand, five thousand new followers yeah. who are following our accounts on LinkedIn and have contacted us through a variety of ways. Um, just personally, I was contacted to help uh, consult on a uh, continuing education course at OSU. So this has been a lot of fun and just kind of a happenstance that happened from this meeting that one day. Um, so, what else can we tell you? I think, I think the, the tricky thing is, you know, how do you count what's, what's an active user of, of the, the social network, right? And, and I wonder how many Gmail users or YouTube users don't even know that they're actually a Google Plus user, right? Exactly. So, yeah. just, just curious what you think the scale and that kind of discrepancy is, whereas I think mean, people who are Facebook users generally know that they're Facebook users even if they're using Messenger or if they're using some of the other kind of properties. So, so the paper we used about active in the college you know, oh, as well. But uh, the paper we used, there were like multiple sources that talk about active users, and different people use different definitions. Mostly it was around using more than three Google properties and having some level of Google Plus connectivity with your searches. And we, our graph had the most conservative of those papers, so we didn't want to overstate that activity. But that is, there is no industry standard definition around that. But that's generally what people do. Yeah, you're right. We struggled with that for quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly where I think the next thing that I'd really like to poke at is, is can you call somebody active within the Google Plus framework yeah. if all I do is YouTube or if all I do is Gmail? You know, am I really a Google Plus member? And follow that up with, does it matter to Google Plus? Do they care? 
is it just a numbers game? Because part of this is, you know, what's the operational cost of all this too? And you know, Facebook's got their cost to run this entire massive social network. What's the cost of you know, Google doing this? And does it matter where I play in the Google ecosystem as long as I'm there? Yeah. I just I wonder if you know, the analogous thing is like if I buy something in a Converse store, does that make me a Nike Plus member? Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah. That's <laughs> similar. Yeah. I think to the same point. Uh, I've seen statistics lately where uh, active Facebook users get Facebook gets approximately you know forty five around forty five minutes of screen time uh, a day, uh, and I think of the billion Google users. Some large percentage of those don't even know that they're actually Google Plus users, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go look for your friends on Google Plus and find like placeholder profiles for them, mm -hmm. you know, but they use lots of features of the Google platform, and that yeah. there's a, I think there's just a really huge gap. But at the end of the day, it's all about building that demographics yeah. behind that account. Yeah. And so, whereas I've got 45 minutes of Facebook time where I'm doing my likes or commenting or, or sharing stuff out and building here, you know, and, and then, of course, that turns into the ads and all that, you know, I'm distributed in that with Google, yeah. you know, where I'm sending emails and so now I've got keywords happening and the same thing with, you know, which videos am I watching on YouTube. And so I've got more of a federated or distributed demographic, and I think that's the point of Google Plus to try to summarize that into one place. You know, I read a paper on the new social it's website. It's sort of an end around as opposed to... Uh, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, they, they've come up with the same... Both these platforms have come to the same number, you know, 1.2, 1.3 billion, mm -hmm. and they're both building these demographic bases. One of them is widely distributed across a number of products. One of them is highly centralized in one product. But they're all there. So I was going to say, there's a website called The New Social. They do a lot of analysis, especially for these two platforms. Mm -hmm. And they said something very interesting. Facebook is, the Facebook community has never grown up beyond how they started out. They're still college kids who want to constantly reinvent themselves. They want to invite you to their party again and again. Google Plus doesn't tell you, hey, invite your friend to use Google Docs or invite them to use Gmail. I mean, there was a bit of an ascent effort at the beginning. But Facebook has this notion where they want you to be in their club all the time once they open the door. Google Plus is like, okay, you're here. Nobody else does what we do. So there isn't quite the need to sort of make you create that platform or invite your friends. So it's a very different approach, and you have to go back to how these companies began, and they haven't lost those roots, for better or for worse. And, I feel, yeah, I think I think along that same thread, they, uh, you know, Google reduces some of the barriers to entry yeah. where it seems like Facebook is adding some in some places where they, you know, they break off this messenger app or the paper app and are forcing people to do things that they really don't like. Well, Google all of a sudden just popped in the, the drive into Hangouts. Wow, that made my life much easier. And it just kind of happened. And because it made my life easier, I, I went to my friends and people I'm doing work with and, and people that I do, you know, talk with and hey, you know, we use Google Hangout and this will be much easier to get done. It just, it, I didn't, they didn't have to you know, really focus on it or, or promote it. It just happened because I found the experience easier. Any more questions? Oh, so, how do you think this might be applied to Nike? Yeah. I think that the goal, there's like a couple of things, right? It's about, you know, my favorite analogy is with Facebook. Like, you have essentially a platform, but then to make it grow, you have to sort of bring other people and make them consider terms of building on your platform, and then roll out features by way of a calendar. Like if you roll out too many features in one go, it's not going to work because you're essentially going to saturate, cannibalize yourself. So that's one lesson that comes out of here that's probably applicable to us because we have the features, we have the audience, getting the sequence and the delivery is something we all struggle with. And the lesson that comes from Google Plus is, if you have everything that interrelates and connects to sort of make your life better overall, people will come and they will stay. I think those are two big learnings I took away from this. And I think the data bore it out over and over. I, I think it parallels very much in, in a lot of ways with what's happening at Nike. I mean, the, the Facebook portion of it, start with a platform, open it up. I think Jeremy spoke to it really well, you know, partners, right? They're, they'll help drive what feature should come next. That, that's a great customer feedback loop right there. But the other side of it I think is really interesting as well is we've got a very distinct activity support engine going here with Nike Plus. And on the other side of the house, we've got this very distinct e-commerce for Nike happening here. And we try to connect those sometimes, but we don't make it easy for ourselves. And, and we don't always 
look for the, the ease of acquisition across. And I think that's where Google was able to take all these different products and consolidate them. And like I just mentioned with Drive, you know, just make it easy. Just put it there. And I think we have opportunity there for bringing commerce and sport, their activity, brand, all these things together into an ease, easy use there. Uh, in your research, did you come across anything that described how Google was able to manage that integration? You talked about bringing the drive uh, in. Did you learn how they did that internally? Because I, I think you're kind of hearing from the room, yeah, yeah, let's link these things up. And I feel like the missing piece is a little bit, well, okay, how, you know, how do we connect these disparate parts of our company? You know, we didn't actually go down that path yet. I mean, so the, the four questions that we put up here where we think about next steps to research were four of probably 30 that we wrote down. And that's one of them, or what are the details around each of these strategies? Um, how did Google do this? Um, I think what were their challenges, yeah. internal and external? The integration actually happened after we were finished with that paper. So to be honest with you, we didn't even try to look into that. But I think that could be a pretty good follow-up to this one. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm definitely interested from a, a whole lot of different angles on that one. And I, there's enough here in just this one thought. Mm -hmm. it takes a year, we could research this for years. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.